Um, we have a great panel now. Um, I, I'd like to next uh, bring up Michelle Avin, President of Business Development and Partnerships at iHeartMedia, uh, who will be leading a fascinating discussion on the intersection of marketing and distribution uh, in media technology. Um, I don't think there's a brand out there that's more suited to do this. Um, iHeart distributes music, content, uh, informs local marketing partnerships uh, across their 800 radio stations in the U.S. So uh, let's call it Michelle, uh, and she can introduce the rest of the panel. <clears throat> Sit right under your head. Headshot. <laughs> That's what I was told. I'm following instructions. So um, I'm really excited. First of all, thank you. Your book, you said to have fun. So we'll definitely have fun today. Um, I have a fascinating panel. And before I introduce them, I was thinking on the way over here, you know, we're all in media, we're all in technology. But when I was thinking about this panel, and I have, you know, I'm very lucky because I get to work with everybody on a regular basis. But I was thinking about what we all really have in common. And what's interesting to me is that this panel, when you think about it, we are all with very traditional, what were very traditional media companies. And you think about iHeartMedia, iHeartRadio. It was six years ago, Clear Channel Radio. Very different company today. I think of Tony Gangalas, who is also a head of strategy and business development for AT&T Entertainment. I'll date myself a little bit. Remember Ma Bell. <laughs> you are not, there's nothing about AT&T Entertainment that screams Ma Bell. 24-hour fitness, I remember when it launched. And it's very different today from what it was. And IBM, and let me introduce Tom Lapsovic. Thank you. CMO for 24-Hour uh, Fitness, and Joanne Pena Binkley from IBM, Chief uh, Global Creative Officer. I think of IBM, and I think about, you know, I remember friends going to IBM for their first job, and, you know, we were making fun of their blue suits and white shirts, and <laughs> IBM is nothing of that company today. So when I think about this group up here, it's like they're all game changers. And they've all truly reinvented um, pieces of their organization. And so they're traditional companies who basically act like startups within these organizations, yet we have this base of power uh, to work from. So um, thank you all for being here today. Very excited. <clears throat> so when you think about you know, media technology and you think about the word probably missing here is partnerships, we throw that around a lot, but the value of partnerships, um, they're invaluable. Because when you think about, when I started working at iHeartMedia, Clear Channel Radio at the time, and Bob Pittman came on board, he said, we need to evolve this company. We need to reinvent it. And there are three things we can do. We can buy, uh, we can build, or we can partner. And a good partnership is you know, priceless. Because two businesses, two experiences come together, you know, and they truly, if it's a good partnership, can benefit the business as a whole. So with that all said, let me start with you, Tony. Um, and I, like I said, I remember Ma Bell, AT&T AT Entertainment, nothing <laughs> like that company. So, you know, everyone wants to reach younger consumers, you know, evolve their company. Um, how does AT&T Entertainment separate um, themselves by partnering to reach younger demos? Yeah, Michelle, I, I, um, I love how you just sort of tied the commonality, you know, amongst us where, you know, we're, we're strong, we have strong positions in the marketplace. We're rather traditional in what we do. And when you think about AT&T, we were Ma Bell, then we were, you know, the wireless company. Um, and then with the DirecTV acquisition last year, we've become uh, a connectivity and entertainment company, mm -hmm. uh, but still largely traditional in what we do or what we did, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and evolving towards getting closer to you know closer uh, to the consumer and closer to media. Um, but everything that we've done on the traditional uh, video distribution side has itself been a partnership. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, we simply put, we buy content from aggregators and we aggregate that, those aggregators' content and we put it in front of consumers. Um, that audience is changing and therefore the content that you aggregate and buy has to change. Um, and uh, AT&T doesn't do anything small, uh, as, as I think you've, <laughs> you, you know, you, you've, uh, you, you've all seen. Um, and we recognize the need to get closer to these younger consumers through content and connectivity. And so we put a half a billion dollars to work with Peter Chernin in the Chernin Group uh, to formulate a company called Outer Media that creates, uh, distributes, and packages content for younger audience, right? Y audiences. Um, second is what we're doing with you guys at iHeart. I mean, we, we recognize that music is a path uh, to reach younger audiences. I'm not quite sure we know how yet, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we're, we're trying a few things uh, to determine whether or not you know, we can break through by bringing music and connectivity and content together. <clears throat> That's great. Tom, let me jump over to you. I mean, sure. um, when I think about fitness brands, and I was thinking about this too. It's like on my phone alone, I have several apps on my phone. I have a seven minute workout. I have my personal trainer. I have a whole host of things on my phone. And I actually last night even went to the app store and looked at how many are there. And there are countless, um, you know, there's definitely 150 plus. Um, however, your brand, your traditional brand, you have reinvented it. Right. and, you know, truly evolved it. So tell us sure. about what's unique about it. Well, you know, as you indicated, fitness is really hot right now. Um, it doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, wearable technologies, different apps, tracking workouts, at-home workouts, all kinds of different niched products with, uh, with health clubs right now. So it's uh, really hot, but, but really competitive. And we really believe we, ha we had to evolve the company. We didn't have any choice of really uh, you know, converting our land-based company of where we deliver um, physical fitness services into essentially a media company where we can be with our consumers throughout their fitness journey, uh, whether it's inside our club or whether it's outside our club. So we, we, have to, we had to evolve uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, we have to put in place uh, appropriate digital platforms so we could uh, uh, be with our consumers everywhere. We had to put in place programming uh, platforms so we can uh, uh, motivate them uh, and also reward them. So I think fitness is, um, uh, you know, it's very traditional on one hand, and yet it's evolving incredibly fast on the other. So we're trying to keep up. We have a long ways to go, but that's why we work with a lot of great partners. That's great. That's great. Joanna. Um, I, I have been to Astor Place. It's wonderful. I've never seen a blue suit there in, in the last year since I've been there. What about there. white shirts? There's definitely white shirts. White shirts are okay. That, that'll be the okay invoke. with the fashion statement. Um, how do you, how does IBM truly um, separate from the other tech companies that are out there? You know, I, there, I think there's a couple of things. We have always been true to what we do, right? We, IBM. Business is our middle name. Um, and when we understand that business is our middle name, we understand that we need to be essential to our clients. Um, and that sense of being essential has always been on a mission to relentlessly reinvent ourselves. In technology, you have to do that. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think one of the things that um, that we've seen, whether it's over the last five years and now even more rapidly over the last three years, um, is a sense of transformation from within, um, and I think rapid transformation, and understanding that when you are a hundred-year-old company, the capability of uh, creating an agile workforce, changing the way people work, um, fundamentally is at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and I think one of the things that gets really gets us excited around partnerships and the kinds of partners we look for is that you know they're the kinds that look for more offerings or a differentiated offering in the marketplace. I like to think of as whether it's us or AT and T, we're so large we make markets where they didn't exist before. When we start to look at what we've done within artificial intelligence um, or in cognitive, you know we're in a new era of computing. We've made that market. And I think when we seek out partnerships, it's in a way that demonstrates what that market can do, 
Um, and I think one of the, the core philosophies of transformation for us has been understanding that while we're in the tech and platforms business, most of you probably don't know that um, you know when we start to think about the percentage of business, 70% of what we do is software and services. It's a big number. Most people still think of us as a hardware company. But with that transformation, understanding that we're in a world of platforms and marketplaces. And when you look at the platforms and the marketplaces, in order for those marketplaces to work, you have to look at an ecosystem of partners um, that are going to complement you. So to your, you had talked about the three, you know, the three strategies, right? Do I bring it all in? Do we buy it, right? Um, or do we partner? Partnerships for us are essential to the growth and essential to bringing new thought leadership to our clients globally. So when you say, I'm going to keep going on that then, so to talk about then, where do you fit in across the industries you touch? Like, how, how can you, can you give a sure. little bit more breath to sure. that? Sure. So <coughs> as the global chief creative officer, you know, why does IBM, you know, first of all, how is IBM creative? I think we're a really creative company. We're out there. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell you we're out there with Watson solving cancer. That's pretty darn creative. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that's um, really exciting for us is that we understand a lot of the innovation that we do can complement business. Um, you know, I think that we are in a really special space of having um, a, a platform of Internet of Things, right, which isn't the future, it's right now. If your brand isn't playing in the space of Internet of Things and data and understanding that that is the new global currency that is renewable, um, you're 10 years behind. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is really critical is understanding how to use that data, how to leverage it in a way that you're looking at from the perspective of creating net new innovations. And so when we understand what our strength is, which is in the area of data, cognitive, and IoT, it's understanding that um, from a media perspective, we never thought we'd be in the media platform business, mm -hmm. but now we are because of IoT. So whether that's through a connected car, a connected building, a connected stadium, we are in the business of creating me uh, media platforms that are engaging, but we didn't do it alone. You know, we sought out partnerships, whether it is with iHeart, AT&T, and many of our stadium relationships. Um, and I think one of the, the key things was understanding what we did really well and what our partners did well, and really sought to look at new business models. You know, um, it becomes really interesting where you get into like, how do we make money at doing these partnerships? Because inevitably we are all in the business of doing that. How do you monetize those things? Um, and I think that, you know, we really began to look at um, different ways of bringing new kinds of offerings to the marketplace in a way that wasn't in a traditional services company whether it was through uh, subscription. We think about a little bit about um, data partnerships. Um, we are one of the most, uh, and I think, biggest trusted brands with people's data. Not because I want to know everything that you're doing, um, but because we know how to protect it. And in that world, in those partnerships, I think that's where we can actually innovate uh, and do net new uh, innovations in a way that I think really uh, pushes business forward, pushes brands forward uh, in a, I think, a, a much safer way than they have in the past. All right. Tony, you talked about, you know, reaching the younger demo and everything and, you know, through partnerships, through content, but breaking through the clutter is really challenging. How are you going about that? What, and you have this massive platform on top of it. So how are you, how are you breaking through the clutter? Well, sometimes you got to go outside of your own platform. You do. Right? Occasionally and, you do. And I think um, that's something I'm actually really proud of a company like AT&T and DirecTV who have these massive platforms being comfortable going outside of our platform mm -hmm. is the only way to really reach this audience. So when you think about the video business in general, you think about a, a value chain that historically was you know, pretty simple. You had content creators, you had aggregators, and then you have distributors like what we are. Um, that game is changing for the youth, for the youth, right? They want to be connected to that content creator. They want to, it's, that's who they consider their friends and their influencers, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the actor, it's not the, it's not the brand of the aggregator or the brand that's given income at connectivity. And so uh, creating content, distributing it broadly, um, 
through this influencer community is a way that we're trying to just bring our customer, uh, the, the youth, right, the young customer, closer to that creator. We have a series called uh, At Summer Break that we did with our partners at, at Full Screen. It's four seasons running. It's a YouTube show, 2.7 billion impressions. Um, and so you just can't get that level of reach and that level of connection uh, by looking purely internally. And so that's the headline. Sometimes you kind of got to go outside of your platforms and you got to be comfortable with doing that. And trusting your partners. <coughs> so it goes back to the partnerships mm -hmm. in terms of what we all share. So Tom, how do you use different communication channels to enhance that customer experience within your brand? Because you, it, yeah. it's a brick and mortar brand. Right. Yeah. So tell us about how you do that throughout the consumer's day, well, throughout it, you their know, journey. It, it's a great question. Um, you know, we have 23,000 employees, uh, 400 and something locations, very traditional brick and mortar business. I mean, uh, high touch, high human involvement. Um, uh, so it's really hard to transform. Uh, also, a lot of young employees, a lot of high turnover with young employees in our business. So we really uh, focused on two things, technology and programming. Um, you know, inside our clubs, uh, everything's connected. Uh, we still have a, a ways to go where, where we, where we want to be, but we control all of our uh, entertainment programming. Mm -hmm. We control, we connect our, our fitness devices. Everything's integrated into our mobile app. Uh, we have virtual fitness inside our clubs to onboard members for classes, for instruction. So we really have looked at how can we uh, transform the technology and programming environment inside our clubs and we've done a good job at that and that obviously helps train and condition our employees as well so it's a it's a great way of not only transforming uh, who we are as a brand but transforming the mindset of our employees and certainly the mindset of our of our consumers outside the club uh, because that's just as important for us as inside uh, we launched a, a, a really an award-winning digital magazine that talks about fitness, that educates and motivates people uh, on fitness. We have a mobile app that tracks their activities, everything they're doing um, in terms of, of uh, wearable devices, at-home workouts that can, you can cast from your phone to your television so you can still work out uh, when you're not in the clubs. Uh, we reward our members uh, for their, their daily tasks, just because fitness is a struggle. Every day exercise is a struggle uh, for everybody. Uh, so we really reward the basic everyday achievements, whether it's walking so many steps or, or uh, taking an at-home class or, or visiting uh, the club. And then, you know, obviously, as, as you know, we integrate music. Music is a fundamental part of exercise. Uh, they go hand in hand. So obviously we're, we work with iHeart both inside the club and outside the club to bring music uh, to engage people and to motivate them while they're working out. So we're, we, we really had to reinvent who we are um, you know, as a company, uh, both internally uh, and externally. Michelle, and if I could follow on from that, because I Absolutely. think there's something really interesting going on. Um, you know, we, we constantly talk about digital, but the reality is, is those physical brick and mortar spaces mm -hmm. are the new digital interface, mm -hmm. right? I think a large part of the transformation that we see is that the, these aren't two different worlds anymore. Right. Right, uh, whether it was because of mobile, but many of the companies that we work with today, one of the things that we see, and this is true in fitness, mm -hmm. I think it's true in retail, sure. um, I, it's true in automotive, it's true if you have a physical location, um, that sense of transformation and what's going on and bringing digital behaviors and connecting with those digital behaviors within your retail environment, within those physical environments mm -hmm. is so critical. And the sense of partnership and the importance of partnership in that place because there is still a sense, look, we still shop, given you know we're Amazoning everything, we still shop tremendously in physical spaces. And so the ability to bring those two experiences together in a way um, that enhances the customer experience, I think is something that you guys do incredibly well. Um, but I think it's something we're seeing across business as a whole. There isn't a brand that doesn't have one of those physical brick and mortar destinations that we aren't talking to today. Um, that is looking at what we would call a digital reinvention mm -hmm. to really bring those uh, new customer behaviors, whether it's showrooming, 
um, whether it is some kind of gamification inside the physical space, um, and whether it's sometimes it's even lowering the amount, the footprint they have in inventory. Mm -hmm. One of the, the interesting parts um, we've talked about many times is that it, within the retail or physical space, all of a sudden we became landowners. We actually became landlords versus maybe in our core business. Yeah. And the reality is, is the transformation we're seeing is those businesses are going from landowners into media companies, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that what has really transformed is we have new competition here, and they aren't from the players that we used to, uh, we're used to actually playing with. No, oh, absolutely. And actually, I want to pivot off that because one of the things that IBM, I don't think you realize sometimes how IBM is involved in that experience. Mm -hmm. So can you share, whether it's the U.S. Open or another real quick, you know, integration that you've done that's sure. so subtle yet so meaningful both to, you know, that, that particular business or event and also from a consumer standpoint? Sure. Um, how many of you have been to the U.S. Open? Ah, lots of hands, good. Then we've touched your life in some way. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we do, and you know, we think about uh, the physicality of space and the importance of technology and how it brings fan experience to life. So whether you've been at the U.S. Open um, or the new Atlanta Falcons Stadium, which will be opening at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, we're responsible for not only designing the experience, the fan experience within those stadiums, but more importantly, the technology that drives all of the data that goes behind the sport. So um, one of my favorite things to do um, at the U.S. Open actually happens to be going underneath the U.S. Open to see the, um, it is essentially what we say are the, the heart of, uh, of love. And the part of that heart of love is understanding that we do all of the data and analytics behind the game. Um, we are the um, broadcast technology and we feed the broadcast technology um, and video streaming capabilities um, to the broadcasters, uh, as well as statistics, live statistics, um, and then all of the apps. So, and one of the things that's so critical, and I think we touched on a um, little bit, was the sense of there is this physicality, but then there is the, the outside, the venue piece of it. And I think one of the things that we have figured out is that the experience within the physical space um, is really critical and you want to reward it, but it needs to be different than that of the broadcast. Um, and I think we're in a time where we're getting to a place where we can individualize um, fan experiences, right? It's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't have to be so mass. And so as we, you know, kind of create that transformation, one of the things that we do, whether we're uh, using Watson and uh, advanced analytics or even natural language, is to be able to bring forth a, a sense of individuality, whether you are in the stadium and a completely different experience that extends the experience in a uh, a relevant way outside of the stadium. But I think, you know, yeah, uh, for absolutely. tennis fans, you know, it's it's exciting. And we have seen uh, a renewed interest in all of the sports that we've touched. No, oh, that's great. Thank you. So parting shots, we all have short attention spans. Uh, <laughs> goldfish have nine seconds, humans have eight. So uh, I'll give everybody a few, uh, a few moments here with the limited time we have. Um, if there's one thing you wanted this audience to tweet, post, snap, whatever they are going to do about uh, your company, what would that what would that sound like? What would those 140 characters sound like, Tony? Uh, a company on the transformation. That's great. Sure, um, the same for us. But you know, I, I think we really appreciate um, fitness comes down to accountability. Um, sometimes people can be accountable to themselves. Sometimes it's very difficult. Um, we, we obviously we find when there's when someone's accountable to someone else, there's a better compliance. Um, we know technology by itself can't do that, and that's why we're really trying to integrate uh, that human interaction that we have with uh, the scalability of technologies and to be with everyone everywhere. And we re really believe that combination of the two. Uh, can make a difference in terms of what we do and what our mission is uh, with our members. Joanna? We've entered the cognitive era. Okay. We are here. 
right? Um, and I think the businesses that will survive understand that it's a time for reinvention for all business, whether you are um, you know, 60 years old or 100 years old or 200 years old, the sense of reinvention is really critical uh, to actually sustaining growth, uh, I'd say, over the next 10 years. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining me. Thank you for the shameless plugs. I appreciate that as well. Thank you very much. Back to thank you. you.